how lousy the uh, diversity metrics are and what we should do about it. Okay. Good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how many people actually done any work involving diversity and use things like indices? Okay. Um, I hope it's a challenging talk and I hope it's interesting, so uh, we'll see. The, the title's delibera deliberately provocative, and, uh, but I'll argue today it is correct, and so we can make it minds up. Off we go. Okay, so four bits. Uh, the introduction to diversity as we sort of know it, then the uh, multinomial diversity model, which I would argue is uh, the way we should be modeling diversity and some example analyses, and then a brief, uh, a brief wrap up. Okay, introduction. Just in uh, somewhat scientific, but somewhat lay words, these sort of phrases describe what my, people might think of as diversity. So, number and variety of living organisms. And, and straight away, we've got a, does that matter? No? Okay. Um, straight away, we've got some implication that there's more than one dimension to diversity. It's the number of things, it's the variety of things. So if you're measuring things which is not unidimensional sort of thing, then obviously it's a bit tricky. Okay, diversity comes in various sort of flavours within and between species, across ecosystems and so on. And uh, people use various ecological indicators such as the number of species and so forth. You've probably come across many of those to measure different aspects of diversity. So again, there's this idea of there's no such thing as a single diversity. And the obvious thing is that diversity is difficult to quantify. Okay, it goes back to uh, Whitaker around about the 60s, and he wrote this large monologue. It's, what, 50 pages uh, in ecology, and uh, it's largely descriptive, but it's got a lot of sort of outline of ideas that have come in terms of hierarchies of diversity and how diversity changes over landscapes and things like this. And the next paper which I would argue is actually the seminal paper about the whole thing, and basically got all the major ideas about diversity correct, but it sort of fell into um, a big black hole after a while. And it's four pages, or five pages, four pages in an index, and it basically, I recommend that you should sort of, uh, have a read of it, it basically outlines some of the mathematics behind diversity. Okay, um, even at the same time, though, there was a few papers, and this is one of them, a good one, which suggesting is something which is a bit of a problem. So, oops, no, one, sorry. So I've got this idea that diversity is defined by indices to measure it, and it's not fostered the sort of uniformity which allows a clear statement of ideas and hypothesis. And obviously in science, if we're measuring things, we have to have a good measure which everybody agrees upon. And hence, progress in college depends on precise and ambiguous definition. So there's indications that things are having problems around that 74. Okay. This is basically from Hill stuff and how he laid it out. Very simple example. So you've got four sites, four species, different species each site. Simplest and yet paradoxically one of the most intriguing little data sets you can have to look at diversity. And the two things that were put forward as terms of diversity is that it should increase with the number of species that occur and the evenness of their distribution. Okay, So again, we've got these two dimensions. If there are S species, it should vary from 1 to S, where 1 is just a singleton species, so obviously the diversity of each of those sites would be 1, and the diversity is S if you've got all sites, oh, an even distribution across the S species. Adding species... Uh, Absences should not change diversity. In other words, if you stack on a whole lot of zeros, the diversity of the site doesn't change. And diversity should satisfy the doubling principle. And what we mean by that, if you took another four species, say species five to eight, which had exactly the same distributions across A, B, C, and D, then the diversities would all double. And you take those as your axioms, and you end up with basically this equation for diversity. Shannon diversity, diversity of order one, and that's the diversity of a single site where you've got uh, I species, S species, and it's defined by the exponential of the sum of the P log P's, where P are just the proportion of abundances. Okay? Now, one thing I talk a lot about is additivity and multiplicity of diversity. This is a huge amount of confusion amongst 
that too. And you can see right away from that expression why the, why the, the confusion arises, because you've got, this is the additive, the additive component, and this is exponential, so exponentials, as we know, are multiplicative. Uh, one thing I'm not going to talk about much today is diversities of order z other than uh, one, because basically we haven't got time. It's also even more complex. But we're talking about diversity of order one largely. Okay, so if we go back to our little data set, then we get the well-known diversities alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha diversity is the mean of the site diversities. Each site diversity on the right-hand column there is one. And so, uh, sorry, very clumsy, this thing. Oops. Uh, try it again. Okay. I'll just uh, go forward. It's all right. I won't use the point. Um, so each diversity has got site one, and when you take the average of the species distributions across all sites, you get the mean of 0.25 across the sites. And so calculate diversity to be four, and gamma diversity is the diversity of that, uh, the total, and then beta is obviously the ratio. Okay, so you're all probably familiar with this. Now, 50 years later, um, ecology is obviously a very young science and is still developing a lot. Statistics is not much older in actual fact. It starts probably 20, 30 years before diversity with Fisher, which you, you all probably know about. And then there's a paper by Marty Anderson appears. Now, the title of this tells you everything that you really know, need to know about the state of diversity as a science. Navigating the multiple meanings of beta diversity, a roadmap for the practice in ecology. Okay? And why should there be multiple meanings of a basic concept in diversity? And why should you actually need a roadmap? It, it's implying a, a level of complexity which um, I would argue doesn't need to exist. And it lists out the multiple measures of diversity and the six types of turnover in the paper six types of variation, and 21 sorts of dissimilarity measures. So if two of you do a study on diversity and you each use different measures, how do you compare these? You can't, can you? Mm -hmm. we need, in other words, if you want to compare across systems, or even within different parts of a system, or a system over time, presumably we have to have the same measuring stick all the time. So how, and how do we choose? How do we choose among 21 dissimilarity measures? Okay, another paper also around about the same time, a year earlier, I think it was, from Tumisto. And a diversity, a beta diversity, straightening up a concept going awry, gone awry. So the, the argument here is that this is a bit of a mess and we need to do something about this. There are two papers she wrote, altogether 40 odd pages, 44 pages in there. And it's really hard going. I read one and a half of them. It's worth trying to read, but uh, it's hard work. And why should it be hard work? This is just diversity. It's not as complicated. And she went through and she categorized all the various measures and she decided in actual fact there's five ways to define diversity, three ways for alpha and four ways for beta. And she argued at the end of it, hey, this is no good. We need to go back to simple principles out line by hill. Okay, now I'm going to show you an example which I hopefully will convince you that diversity indices should not be used. This is an extreme example, but it's not totally extreme. Very simple situation, conservation case. So you've got 20 patches of equal size, each with 20 species, and the same distribution across each side, and no species in common. So we've got 20 species on the first one with a certain distribution. Next one, 20 other different species, but the same sort of proportional abundances. Okay? No species in common, so dead simple. Okay, and you'll see that the common sense answers which we'll calculate are simple and correct. And we'll see what happens with indices. Okay, we'll do the indices with your Gini index, which is 1 minus some p r squared. And the diversity of each patch is 0.95. If you put p equals whatever the p's go in there, it gives you 0.95. And then if you calculate the regional diversity, you know, that's the diversity of the collection of sites, you get 0.998. Okay, the two indices. Okay, so that's just sort of alpha beta. And you can then say, if you're the developer, I just want to conserve one patch, and let's see, work out how much diversity is lost. Okay? I'm pro developer right now. If I take away one patch, 
and recalculate diversity, we find that we get, or we just consider the diversity of one patch, which is 0.95, over the total diversity, 0.998, we get 95.2% of diversity. So one patch is considered 95% uh, of diversity. On the other hand, if you're a conservationist, consider the 19 sacrifice sites, and you can calculate diversity of those according to the index, it gives you 0.997. And so we've lost 99.9% .9 of the diversity. So we saved 95.2 by keeping one site, and we've lost 99.9. Now that's, that's what that index tells you. Okay, That is the correct interpretation of that index. So it's obviously not very good. And uh, if you use diversities of order one or richness, then you get slightly better, uh, you get better answers. But are still not very good. So indices shouldn't be used. They really shouldn't. OK. In more general terms, there's a whole lot of problems that come across diversity. Is diversity or are diversity multiplicative or additive? And we've seen in the formula that's written down, it's got a bit of both. But we'll, we'll tease that out. We've got these multitudinal definitions of beta diversity in particular. and if you look at what people tend to do in diversity studies, there are either sort of hierarchies, alpha, beta, gamma, or species turnover measured with some measure of turnover, a la Marty Anderson and so forth. But that's incredibly restricted. And let's use a simple case. When you measure things, you don't always put them in boxes, do you? You'll often have continuous gradients. For example, how does diversity change with temperature as temperatures warm up in the future? How does diversity change in space along a gradient? How does diversity change across the barrier reef? How does it change the depth and so on? How does it change over time? So we want to be able to say how diversity changed, not only with just categories, but we want to do it in a, a much more broader way so we can look at uh, quantitative predictors and all sorts of things. And we want to be able to predict. We want to make a statistical model of it. OK, the indices themselves are misleading and really don't serve any useful function, I would argue. But the important thing, which is the real focus of this thing, there's no systematic way now to relate diversity to environmental, spatial, and other drivers. Whereas, you know, for other, other attributes to an ecological system, suppose you took total abundance, you can just fit it in a regression model in terms of environmental, spatial, and other drivers and get some sensible answers. So why is diversity different? Okay. What's so strange about diversity that we can't just bang in a regression? And the problem, or the answer to the problem, was a I don't think, uh, in terms of a friend of, um, in terms of literature, mine, that Wittgenstein, he talked in metaphors, the solution to the problem is the vanishing of the problem. So how do we vanish the problems of diversity? And the answer is, the first thing is realise that the drivers do not affect diversity directly. What do environmental drivers affect? Which is... Right? Species. Exactly right. Exactly right. They do affect a species abundances. And how do you get diversity from a species abundance? Just calculate it. Put it in the formula. So we don't model diversity, we model the abundances. And so we need some model for the multi the multivariate data, the species abundances, in terms of environment, species, and time. And diversity is then just calculated from those estimated species abundance. And so that's the key. The environment drives the species, and then from the species configurations that we've got from the model, we just calculate diversity. Easy. OK, so what do we need to do this? We need a statistical model to relate the multivariate species proportions data, as uh, diversity is calculated from the proportions abundance, to multiple complex drivers. You've all come across generalized linear models, obviously. Probably all use them often, don't you? Yeah, that'll do. And we want a single definition. I'm just going to focus the diversity order one to represent all possible configurations of species abundance. OK. What we don't need. We don't need those. Chuck them away. Don't need indices of diversities. And alpha and beta and gamma just turn out to be basically three special cases of uh, diversities uh, in general. Okay, now we're going to do this in terms of this thing called the multinomial diversity model. 
which is actually just a multinomial model which is interpreted in a particular way. And it's defined by three components. First of all, if you look at the way um, diversity is defined, it's defined in terms of data. There's no parameter in there, so somehow we've got to introduce parameter into it to make a statistical model. And there's already a model to measure model proportions of data of multi species. It's called the multinomial logic. It's just like a logistic regression, only got multiple columns. And the columns, sums of the columns add up to one. You have a multinomial model that will do the job. Okay, but there's a little twist which is also very useful, and is the important link which has uh, not been realized before, is there is a relationship between diversity and the likelihood of the multinomial logistic model. Likelihoods are basically a measure of, a bit like probabilities, a measure of how likely uh, a model is. It's related to the deviance. If you come across that. Okay, so the other thing we need to sort out is this multiplicative additive stuff. And we can do that referring to two things. So entropy and diversity are, again, two things which get confused. Entropy is just this bit over here, the H1. Let's see if we can get this little button to work. Hey. This is entropy. This is diversity. And so diversity is just the exponential of the entropy. Okay. And so this sort of, if you want, clarifies the riddle of the additive, additive and multiplicative. Entropies are additive, diversities are multiplicative. Entropies, where we do all our calculations, right? Model calculations are all additive. If you look at, you know, think about the sums of squares, going back to analysis of variance and regression and so on, and the generalization for general linear models, it's all additive. And diversities, just the exponential out the multiplicative, but that's what just gives us the scale of interpretation because diversities are expressed as the no effective number of species, okay? So the diversity actually gives you a number which means something in terms of ecology. But the entropies are the bit we use for all sorts of uh, calculations and uh, also some graphical expressions as well, graphical expressions of models. All right. Uh, I'll go through this quickly because it's not that important. To parameterize the model, we just uh, change this one to pi i, it just gives us the entropy. And this is now summed over species and uh, sites. That's n sites now. And diversity is just exponential of that. Now, this parameter can represent any configuration of, configuration of sites. So, for example, if you just put it in the JJ sites, this gives you alpha diversity, average the whole lot. That's just what the dot signifies. Gives you gamma diversity and so on. Okay. Glenn, sorry, I just yep. want to clarify that. Yep. So the I is indexing species. I is indexing species. J, J is indexing yeah, species. Don't ask me why people in diversity do this. It's the wrong yeah. way around. But any statistics, they just drive me crazy. J is indexing sites. J is indexing sites. PIJ is observed relative abundance. Uh, PIJ is the reserved observed proportions. Yeah. Proportions. Yes, and PIJ is predicted from A. Pi ij is the parameter which you're trying to estimate, which represents that. Yeah. Now, this thing about the i's and j's, it's the wrong way, and now it's the wrong way, and it's but try changing the whole literature. It's just in diversity literature. And it all goes back to the people that used to put the matrix the wrong way around because it wouldn't put in spreadsheets. <laughs> so, I guess my question is what, what constitutes an observation? So, that that's close to a likelihood across the top. It is a likelihood, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. the question is what constitutes an observation, right? So for you, an observation is, is the proportion yeah. as opposed yeah. to the P observation P being the, the individual. Yeah, PIJ of the data. PIJ of the data matrix of proportions. So, you, so you, suppose, you, suppose you've got 10 species and 20 sites, okay? Right. So your PIJs are those uh, 10 by 20, that's the 10 by 20 matrix. So it's a multivariate response. Each case is a site. And then we'll have, obviously, the predictors as well. I the reason I'm asking the question mm -hmm. is you can imagine you had multiple sites with very different sample sizes, right? Yes, sure. Very, very different numbers of individuals. And so in that case, the site, the, the heavily sampled sites would give you more information about PIJ. Yes, yeah. yeah. So so obviously, in, in a, when you've got multiple sites, then S is the number of species that occur in the whole data set. Right. So, you know, in other words, if you've got... If you go to a site and you've just got a couple of species, 
then they go, they go in the appropriate, those their balances go in the appropriate columns and the rest are all zeros. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, now the multinomial logic model is basically just a linear model and it's set up in such a way that it constrains the responses to lie between zero and one. Okay, and that's basically just the mathematics of that. And you end up with something called the linear predictor, which is this bit. And then this is it, it converted basically to uh, something like between zero and one. And these are the proportional things we're trying to estimate. All right. Okay. And the final link we need is that if you look at these, the algebra of all these things, this is the log likelihood of a multinomial logistic model, okay, P log to P, and obviously it looks very much like the entropy, and the relationship between the two is that the entropy is just the negative of log likelihood divided by the number of cases, and obviously diversity is just the exponential of that. Now, the point about this is quite simple, is that it means that when we fit the log likelihood, we maximize the log likelihood, right? That's the further maximum likelihood for estimating uh, parameters. We estimate by maximum log likelihood. So if you maximize that, you're minimizing this because of the negative sign. Okay? And it's obviously minimizing this too because this is just the exponential of it. So the maximum log, log likelihood solution to the, the model gives you minimum diversity. So you're looking for minimum diversity of a configuration of sites. Okay? Right. Which is just nice mathematically. Okay, let's forget all that. You want? This is now how it all works. Okay, there's two parts now. So we're looking at species and diversity. So for species, we might want to do things like estimate uh, and plot abundance of species along gradients and between groups. So there's all sorts of numerical ways that we might want to, and graphical ways that we might want to represent our solutions uh, from this model. The other thing we can do, I'm not going to actually show you much about this today, is because it's a multinomial model, you're fitting these either bell-shaped curves or squiggly, all sorts of functional type shapes, but you can actually estimate, as from the fit of the model, the location of each species, where it is in space, and its span. So if you're fitting you know, a very simple model, we use sort of this Gaussian type distribution, you can estimate from the model where it's located and what its span is. So you're getting out lots and lots of information from this model. Okay. And the other thing you can do, which is great fun, is remember I said we do all our calculations and exploration in terms of entropy, and we also look at the outputs in terms of entropy as much as we do in terms of diversity. Okay. Now, if you consider a whole collection of models, which we'll often do, because like, you know, if you're doing a statistical analysis, you might think of the model where you just fit the constant, which is the ground mean, think of a model down the bottom where you fit the sites. Well, there's all sorts of models which might be nested that you fit in between them. Okay? So it might have diversity depends in, let's talk about GBR, depends on distance across the shelf, plus distance along the shelf, plus depth, plus the weather last week, plus the size of the reef, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a whole series of predictors, and you can whole, have a whole collection of hierarchical models, and then we will be able to do things with that collection of, um, of entropies. Okay? So that's all I'm doing here, is I'm just summing over now a whole collection of models. Now, that's a cube of numbers, okay? It's got three dimensions. One is sites, one is species, and the other is model. And you can look at that in all sorts of ways and get a huge amount of information. And I'll just show you a couple of examples of that later on. Okay? Treasure trove. All right, some examples. And the first one I'm going to give you, I've, helped, I've shown some people before, it's really hard. And it's really paradoxical. But if you can understand it, you can understand it. There's things. So a little demonstration date. And then some other ones. I've got, we've got plenty of time. It's okay. It's good. Demonstration. Okay, back to this one. You, you only need to know where it's data set to understand the whole diversity. And we're now looking in terms of statistical models. So the three columns on the left are now the ABC, which is sort of group predictor, then the mean, which just gives you the overall mean. And now say I'm introducing a quantitative variable X, which goes one, two, three, four. Okay? And so I might want to see how this diversity depends on X. Anybody, what would you do if I asked you to do that right now with your, with your current approaches? You might calculate site diversity, right? And what would you do then? Do a regression on X? And what would the answer tell you? What's the site diversity of every site? 
one, isn't it? Agree? So if you regress that, zero, on, yeah, you get so zero slope. Right? But it doesn't change. Entropy doesn't change. So if you regress it on the x, one, two, three, four, it gets slope zero. So it's saying that diversity is not changing along the side. What was wrong about that statement? It's not diversity is not changing. What is, is what is not changing along my gradient? Site diversity. Site diversity is constant, isn't it? Is there an error on that slide? Is there supposed to be a one somewhere at site C? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank it's you. To well spotted. Sorry, that's supposed to be the original data. Yeah, that, that's actually the test just to see if everybody's awake. <laughs> that one should be a one, obviously. Right, my apologies about that. Thank you. Okay. Right, now, if you do a multinomial diversity analysis, this is what you get. This is a, a little analysis of the energy type field analysis, analysis of entropy and diversity. So if you fit the mean model, you get an entropy of 1.36. Take the exponential of that, you get diversity of 4. But the linear model fits exactly, right? The one degree of freedom regression, multinomial regression, explains with the x1234 as the predictor, explains the data perfectly. So let's see what it looks like. Because, because we now have a model, we can predict what, and it's a model for the species, we can predict what the species abundances will be all the way along the gradient, right? So I've got my multinomial model. The, predict, the, the data were 1, 2, 3, 4, but I can put any numbers in there and just predict what the proportions of the species will be. And then they're, they're the curves you get. That's exactly what it looks like. So if we, this is species 1, it starts up here, it goes down there and flat along there. And this is species 2, it goes up down there like that. These are the predictions. Now, if you're halfway between site 1 and site 2, halfway between site 1 and site 2 along the gradient, what's the most sensible species distribution to put in there for species 1, 2, 3, 4? You've got to go from species 1 being 1 to 0, and you've got to go from species 2 going from 0 to 1. Species 3 and 4 stay the same. So halfway between A and B, what's your best guess as to what should be the species composition? Remembering that the species proportional abundances have to add up to 1, don't they? Species proportions always have to add up to 1. So if you're halfway between A and B, what's it going to be? We can't go on until you've got an answer. 0.5. It has to be 0 0.5, 0 0.5, doesn't it, right? Because one's got to start, let's go back to the picture. One's got to go down, and the other's got to go up, and they've got to meet, and if you look across where they intersect, it's got to be... The rate to which they go up and down is something we can talk about, but we won't. Okay. So that gives you those four things. So that is the actual diversity level. So the diversity, uh, which we will now plot, looks like those gray lines. Okay? Calculate your proportional balance all the way along. And that's where you get those gray lines. So it goes, starts up, and then it shoots up, goes down, shoots up, down, down, shoots up. So everywhere apart from the sites, the diversity is greater than it is on the actual sites. I'm talking about diversity now, not site diversity. Right. And if you just take the other ones away so you can see what's going on. Now, the red line represents what? what you just told me. Look at the curve, look at the scale on the right. The red line represents site diversity. Okay? The gray line represents total diversity. And the distance between them, from there to there, represents turnover. This represents turnover of species. And so what we're actually doing is we're breaking total diversity into turnover and site diversity. And diversity just equals turnover times site diversity, which is really just the generalization of gamma equals beta times alpha. Okay? Now we can do this for all the models. That's a bit pathological. So let's just look at a more general example. Okay? What I've done is just simulated some multi-species data here. Right? They're just sort of modal distributions along a gradient. We've got 50 sites, 25 species. The little red dots, crosses rather, are the site diversities. The horizontal red line is the uh, uh, um, alpha. The total green line is um, gamma. 
And then what it's got, also got is the gray line, which is the actual diversity. And the gray, the gray dashed line is just the average of those. And then the dark red line is just the smooth regression line through the sites. So it represents the smooth sites diversity. Okay, It's all very easy to calculate. And so let's just go through this. So this is the estimated average site diversity as you go along the gradient. So sites here have obviously got higher diversities, site diversities because of the crosses. And they're a bit lower at the end, so that's the fit there. And this represents the total diversity, if you want. And this distance all the way down, the edge points, represents turnover. So you've got greatest diversity and also greatest turnover and greatest site diversity in the midpoint along the gradient. Okay? So this is how the total diversities are changing. This is how the site's changing. And the distance represents turnover. And that is diversity modeled along gradient. Okay. Let's now explore a, a bigger bigger data set and we'll look at some other ways of getting information out and some of the wealth of information you get out of these things. So I'm looking at the multivariate case now. It's my favorite data set. It's the only data set that uses publications virtually. By Tabrak and sp spider data. And I've just taken a small subset of that. The original one has 12 species, this has got six. The original one had six environmental measures, and it's just two and the 28 sites. And these are just things are measured on a zero, nine scale. And so let's have a look at where we go. We're fitting a collection of models here, and we basically get analysis of diversity table, which looks very much like any analysis of uh, variance type table or analysis of deviance table. In fact, you can, you're actually calculating deviance. I'm not showing them because you don't really need to. And we've got the entropies and the change in entropies. So I go from left to right. The degrees of freedom in the model. And the degrees of freedom are large numbers because you've got six species. So the changes of degrees of freedom are five each time. And the 135 is because there's 28 sites times five minus five for one degree of freedom, which is 135. The sites model is saturated, and so there's zero degrees of freedom. Okay, so very much like you normally see, table. And so these are the entropies. These are just the exponential of those, which is the diversities, and these are the changes. Okay, And I've just used permutation tests here just to see what's significant. And when you do that, you basically find out the water plus herbs model is OK. These ones don't act very much. Big difference down to here. So sites is obviously uh, there's quite a lot of variation going the sites level within that. OK. And there are six species. And the total diversity is, or, or gamma, is 5.37. So the total distribution is quite even because that's got a maximum of six, obviously, because of six species. And the site diversity is three, so there's still quite a lot of species at each site. And so the turnover is just the ratio of those two, which is about uh, 1.8. And these are the individual turnovers. And you can see the biggest effect by far is of uh, water, then a much lesser effect of diversity. This is probably the best place to interpret these because these are additive. So in terms of the total variation explained, uh, there's point, what is it, point 0.6 to explain, and water explains half of it. This then explains a third of, a third of that, and then there's a little dribble here, and that's what's left over. Okay. So we've got a formal analysis, and we can do all sorts of plots. Looking at just what happens to the species, one of the things we get out are estimated species abundances, obviously, and we can estimate those for the space spanned by water and herbs. And it's <coughs> a two-dimensional surface. And if you look at the distributions of these things, the four of them that sit in different corners, so the uh, Pardubu species uh, tend to like uh, very uh, wet places without many herbs. And this one likes uh, lots of herbs and lots of wet, and so on. This, this one's in that corner. So four of them are in four different corners of distribution. These two are far more widely spread. That's the most widely spread of them all, a bit less so than that one. So you get out the species distributions, which is very nice. But the other thing you can do is you can look at what species are affected by what environmental drivers as well. We, so we're now with our cube. We're looking at our cube now, which is broken down by the different models. So we've got five models. We've got the saturated, sorry, we've got four models. The saturated model, the water model, the water plus herbs, and the sites. They're the four, four symbols. And 
those models explain a certain amount of the variation for the six species, and that's what we've plotted up here. They explain the entropy, obviously. And so if you look at this, it's quite a strong pattern, because three of them, drop dirt, LRPC, and LRFAB, are all very well explained simply by square, which is water. So if that, that's what's to be explained. That's the site stuff, and the further these are down here, obviously, the more they're explained. So water largely accounts for the variation in that one, that one, and that one. The other three aren't quite as well explained. This is not very well explained at all, because the symbols have got to be right close to the, this one for it to be highly explained. And in some cases, there's a, a reasonable amount explained. In this one, this one, there's a reasonable amount explained by verbs going from water. Obviously, the order of these would be, make a difference, and you could put them in the other way if you wanted to do so. OK. So we can poke inside that. And that's just one way of breaking up the cube. You can, instead of breaking it up by species, we've averaged over sites there. Um, so we've got the, remember, the cube is species by sites by models, and we've averaged over uh, sites. We could have averaged over species and looked at it by sites and so on, uh, sites by entropy and so on. So uh, many things you can do there. OK, another one. This is a much, much bigger data set. And uh, from seafloor biodiversity stuff, uh, some surveys conducted by CSIRO and Ames. And I'm looking at a spatial model here, but also putting in, there's a lot more variables in, in actual fact in the final one, but spatial model then with smooth terms in uh, depth and sediment. And again, just let's have a little look at how much is explained. Look at the entropy. So this, uh, now, uh, if we look at the diversity, there are. 347 species in that data set, and the total diversity is only 55, which is really quite low. Lots and lots of rare species, 365 sites. So the maximum value this could be would be 347. And each site has got an average diversity of six out of possible 347. So it's very, very sparse data. 90, it's about 94% of the data is zero, um, uh, which sort of yeah, serves even more. Okay, so the model. It goes explain if you put count all, go through one by one. This, from 1.8 to 4.01, about 2.2 to explain, of which this explains about 0.8. So the spatial model is explaining about a third the variation, and then there's a bit more explained by that, and then a little bit more by that. These are all highly significant. And in terms of diversity, it can be a bit misleading, so you have to be careful. It's, because it's multiplicative scale, you should talk about proportions and Again, so you, you look at the spatial smooths, accounting for half the diversity sort of thing, and so on. But this is, this is really the best way to interpret it. OK, and we'll look at this, these two gradients. First, the depth and grain size. And it's the plots you've seen before, which is to show this on real data, so to speak. And you get the same sort of things that we saw from the simulated data, which is, is kind of nice. And so if we find the little red thing. This is site diversity, so it, the site was site diversity averaged about, what was it, six, I think? And so here it's down to five, it goes up to around about eight, probably around about here. This is a lot. And good point, these graphs, although we're labeling them diversity, they're on log scale. Why am I doing that? If it's on log scale, what am I actually plotting? I'm plotting entropies, right? And the whole point about a graph is the distance from there to there should translate. If it's the same length, it should represent the same difference, right? So it's got to be an additive scale. So for inter and if, you, if you want, you can just label these as entropies as well. We can just take a log of these. So it's nice to have these on a diversity scale so they can be interpreted in terms of number of species. But if you're looking at proportional lengths and so forth, uh, they're also interpreted correctly in terms of doubling and halving and so forth. So Highest diversity in terms of total diversity is around about 55 or so up there, but it drops right down to about 13. So a huge variation, uh, likewise quite a large variation. Site diversity from as little as what, three down here up to about eight, and most turnover in the middle. This one's a bit interesting because the actual uh, site diversity is relatively constant, but there's quite a change in total diversity. And so it's up to 50 here, down to probably about 25 there. So the change in diversity is about twice. The turnover there is about twice what it is there. So what that means is, in terms of the sites, if the grain size is fairly sort of average, then we're getting a lot of turnover, meaning 
What does that translate to in terms of, say, sites with similar grain sizes? If there's a lot of turnover, they must have relatively more different species than sites where the grain size is very, very big. Okay? In other words, if you collected all the sites which um, had a sort of average grain size, calculated their alpha, beta, gamma, you'd find that the sites were more different in the species than the sites up here. That's what this is, that's what the turnover is telling us. Just another way of expressing it. Okay, spatial ones, much more pretty. Um, and so this is the same sort of thing, but it's, we haven't got the points plot because it's all two-dimensional. There's only so much we can uh, put on. So we've basically got site turnover. I've called it total. It's a, it's a bit of an awkward word. It's total for the, the model. Not, it's not total. It's total not meaning total diversity of the whole data set, but it's just a local total diversity, if you want, a local uh, gamma, if you want a better expression. OK, let's have a look and see if, if we, I'll take some little regions and see if we can interpret this. Uh, it's a bit murky on this, but it's fine. Right. If you take this, it, this is the site diversity for the far north, obviously, and its diversity is round about here. It's round about six, six or seven. The turnover there is very, very low, and because site times turnover gives you total, this is an area, therefore, of low total diversity and low turnover. So most of the, you know, the, the sites here are all fairly similar in terms of species composition the same sort of species, and there's not a lot of turnover on that spatial scale of this model. Right? If you go to some other places, let's go offshore here, we've got the highest basically site diversity, which is around about 9, 10, but also the turnover in the, this strip here is still very high, it's around about 8, and so that's where you're getting very high. Multiply those together, about 8 by 7 gives you high levels up here, around about 60. So this in terms of total diversity <coughs> is the highest area. That's not always the case. There's other areas where, if you like here, there's sort of very mm, average sort of site of it, average to low, average to low, average to low. So that's sort of more in between. And you can see the diversity gradients across. So, for example, there's a cross shelf gradient here with a peak peak in the middle. It's going from site to this, going from about four to uh, whatever, around about eight. Um, but it's not reflected there. Okay. So this is conversely the turnover is highest where the uh, site diversity is lowest, and the turnover is lowest where it's highest. So you get an awful lot of information about these sorts of things. Here again, high, relatively high, moderately high, site diversity, fairly low turnover, fairly low type of diversity. So that's what we get from those. OK, some conclusions. Yeah, actually, we finish on time. All right, uh, traditional diversity, I would argue, is a a theory in crisis. Any of you people read Theory of Science and you know, Thomas Kuhn and all that stuff? I've got one now. It was fashionable in those days, wasn't it? Uh, you should do. You should do. Um, okay, the multi normal diversity model parameterizes diversity and links it to the multi normal logic model. And the important thing is we can now model diversity or, but through species, remember? Remember the diversity is just a sort of offshoot of it which can include multiple quantitative and categorical drivers, and I would argue this should lead to a comprehensive and better understanding of diversity. The question is, this new approach will encounter resistance, will it prevail? I have no idea, but if it does, it'll take a long, long time. A lot of people invested a lot of careers in writing papers based on different approaches to diversity, so it's interesting. Okay. Uh, some references. Uh, uh, so, uh, this is sorry, it's, yeah, software. Uh, there's a package on CRAN called the MDM, uh, and it enables you to do these analyses. It's in state flux, it's always changing, so I hope to put up an update in the next month or so. Uh, the paper is published in Ecology a year or so ago, and the just definitely, if you really want to understand about diversity, read those top four papers. Read the five papers, read, read mine as well. Um, and uh, you should be in good shape. Okay, thank you very much.